appreciate everyone who's here. I want to tell the story of an actor who several years ago had a dilemma. He was the star of a TV show that wasn't doing all that well in the ratings, but that wasn't his problem. This actor learned that an actress who also starred on this show wasn't being paid as much as the other male actors. So he, being beloved by the fans of the show, had a lot of influence. This actor went to the studio executives and used his influence to demand equal pay for this actress. The show was Star Trek. The actor was Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock, and the actress was Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura. That's right, Leonard Nimoy was into equal pay for equal work way before it was cool. Nimoy believed that he could lend Nichelle his privilege, his gender privilege as a male actor and his position with the fans. By lending his privilege to Nichelle, he furthered her position as an actress by giving her access to better pay. Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with a DevOps conference? Well, software as an industry suffers from a lack of diversity. Whether it's open source or closed source, developing or deploying code, the people working in software development don't represent the general population, nor are rewards like pay, promotions, and positions of leadership equally distributed. We face the reality that a woman working today on a DevOps team who has mastered tools like Puppet, Chef, and Docker has less access to equal pay than an actress on a failed TV show in the 60s. However, I believe that Leonard Nimoy provided a model for how we can address this problem. Notice that Nimoy didn't wait for Paramount to announce a diversity program, nor did he wait for a better policy about salaries to be handed down by his superiors. Nimoy acted, and he acted based on his beliefs about what was right. Nimoy lent Nichols, a fellow artist, the privilege he had as a male actor and helped her participate in the benefits of his gender privilege. And I think there are a lot of Leonard Nimoy's in this audience. And I also think that there are other ways to lend privilege to make technology a more diverse and inclusive industry. But first, we have to understand the difference between diversity and inclusion. So let's say you are throwing a party at your house. Well, diversity is sending invitations to people to come to your party. Inclusion is making sure that the people feel welcome at your party. So you know that some people had to make a longer journey to get to your house, so you're a little bit more gracious when they walk in the door. Or you know that some people have food allergies, and so you make sure that there are different options, maybe gluten-free options for those folks to eat. And you also know that some people may not drink alcohol, so you make sure that there are plenty of now non-alcoholic options for those guests. That's being inclusive. Inclusion, as opposed to diversity, requires empathy. And that just means that you understand that people are different. Diversity is easy to gain. And you can use symbolic gestures or meaningless numbers to do so. But inclusion, that takes real effort. And as Leonard Nimoy realized, an inclusion won't come from big companies, like the studios that make TV shows and movies. It will take a grassroots movement of individual people making a change. Now, since we work in tech, especially those of us who are involved in open source software projects, we understand grassroots movements. One of the first books on open source software was The Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric S. Raymond. In this book, Raymond explored the miracle of Linux. And we all use Linux, I'm sure, every day. We know that it, it's been very successful and that open source basically rules the world. But that wasn't the case when Raymond wrote this book. 
There was this crazy project that was designed to take this complicated kernel and get everyone involved to create an operating system, and it worked. So Raymond began to understand and look at open source software, and he distilled lessons that he applied to his open source projects. And, op and Raymond likened closed source projects to cathedrals, where there's centralized command and control, and things are very rigid, and he contrasted this with this bazaar, which was loud and boisterous, and everyone had some amount of power. And spoiler alert, the bazaar model produced better results. The lesson that is most well remembered from this book is this one. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Now, I hope that many of you have heard this phrase, but I like the more formal version that's also in the book, and it reads as, follow, as, as follows. Given a large enough beta tester and code developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. That is a statement of inclusion. Raymond linked the size of the code developer base to problem solving. And what else is innovation than the ability to solve a problem? So if we let software development, if we let DevOps be this big tent, this babbling, boisterous bazaar of people who are involved in the development of software and dedicated to making it better, then there is no problem we can't solve. But the sad reality is that just like our repositories are protected by passwords and permissions, often our companies and our projects are protected by privilege. And there are voices that we keep out of the bazaar since we don't create a safe space for them to take part in what we do. Certain groups have a hard time lending their voices to the babbling bazaar that Raymond described because they lack privilege. And, and this is tragic. Because whatever problem you have, either your company or your projects or your deployment process, someone out there can fix it. But they are often denied entry into our companies. We don't let them in because we are comfortable in the way that things are. And change is difficult, but I think it's necessary. Now, to understand how this works, and what we all can do to make things better, we have to understand privilege. But before we do that, it's really important that we understand what privilege is not. Having privilege does not mean that life is easy for you or that you haven't worked hard. It does not mean you haven't sacrificed or that you aren't good at what you do. Privilege is like riding a bicycle up a hill. It's hot, you're working hard, you got this really bad leg cramp, but you're trying to get to the top of that hill. However, some people don't have your privilege, and for them, it's a harder journey. There are things that they have to deal with that you don't because you have privilege. However, having privilege does not remove you from the responsibility of understanding that some people don't have privilege and their journey through technology is a little harder than yours. Now, I have gender privilege, if that wasn't obvious, and I know I've worked hard, but I know that working in tech as a male means that I have benefits that I enjoy that those who don't have gender privilege lack. One of those benefits is being given the benefit of the doubt when I talk about what I do. And there are some people who don't get that benefit when they talk about what they do. And often, people who lack privilege, especially male privilege, have to work harder because they run into obstacles that I don't even notice. Last night I flew in and it was late and I was walking around just the downtown area. It was 1 a.m. and you know, no one's gonna probably attack me. I'm six foot two, um, I'm a male. But if I did not have gender privilege, I would have probably been a bit more concerned and paid a lot more attention to where I went. So now that we know what privilege is not, let's define privilege. 
Privilege is simply access to benefits based on traits that you possess. Those benefits could be schools, jobs, social circles, leadership roles, and wealth. There are two major categories of privilege. The most well-known category is birth privilege. And those are the traits that you're born with that you don't even choose for yourself. Those are privileges like parental, racial, gendered, and physical privilege. It's ironic that these are the privileges that despite the fact that we don't choose them for ourselves, they are the root of most bias. The second category of privilege is birth privilege. And those are things that change as we grow. And those are things like where you go to school or your religion or your gender identity. They change and they can often be in flux. Now, we naturally share privilege with people who are like us. Those who have gender privilege usually share their benefits with people who also have gender privilege. Or if you have racial privilege, you often share those benefits with people who also have racial privilege. But it is far more powerful to lend privilege to those who lack privilege. Now, the combination of your birth privileges and your selected privileges make up your portfolio of privileges. And this portfolio creates a set of benefits that make it easier to work in tech. Now, I'd like everyone to look up here and identify at least one privilege that you have. Just think about it. Some of you may have two. Some of you may have all of these privileges. Now, once you have in mind at least one privilege, think about what your career in tech or your career in DevOps would be if you started without that privilege. What if you started your career without gender privilege or racial privilege? without the privilege of having gone to Stanford or MIT, or if you didn't have the ability to walk around or see or speak or hear, how much harder would your journey through DevOps be without these privileges? Now, also think that there are people in tech who work every day, some of them alongside you, who have to navigate their careers without those privileges. And they are often at a significant disadvantage. But you can help remove these disadvantages by lending your privilege. Now, I want to illustrate how to do this through three women. They're real people, but the names have been fictionalized, and I've created some scenarios to walk through. But I think these women are probably similar to people you work with every day. So for each type of privilege, and I'm going to describe three, of, of privilege lending, I'm going to give an example of how it works that we can all probably know because we've all heard about them. But I'm also going to share how you can implement this privilege lending practice in your everyday work. So the first type of privilege lending is credibility lending. And that's providing visibility to people without privilege. Often LGBT people feel restricted in technology because we work in a heteronormative industry. But by lending privilege, I think you can help members of that group unlock their potential. Here's an example. A few months ago, DeRay McKesson, who's a well-known activist, went on the, on the Stephen Colbert show. And Stephen Colbert switched seats with DeRay in a in an illustration of credibility lending. And what DeRay gained was a very powerful platform of the Colbert Show. And this raised his profile, and that's how credibility lending works. So let's say you work with B, and she's one of your best developers. In fact, she was the one behind that killer feature that you guys rolled out a few weeks ago. And customers love it, and uh, she's really proud of it. Well, why don't you lend her credibility by co-presenting that feature to the board and raise her profile in your company and let her be more visible and hopefully get more recognition for what she contributes to your company? The next type of, of, of privilege lending is access lending. 
And that's providing entry for people without privilege. Often women who work in tech feel that they question their abilities because they lack gender privilege, which is a shame because women provide tremendous value to technology. But I think that access lending can be a powerful technique to help fix this. Here's an example. Tracy Chow is a really well-known activist who, who fights for equality in technology. And she recently told the story of when she was a student at Stanford. And one of her professors insisted that she become a TA for a CS course. Now, Tracy was hesitant. She, re she, she resisted because she felt that what well, everyone who I know, and a lot of them were men, brag about how easy the courses are and the labs are straightforward. And she felt that since she was struggling, she wasn't qualified to be a TA. But when she started doing the work and got access to some of the grades and the work that her male colleagues had, she realized, I'm just as good as these guys. And so she was able to reassess her position in tech and feel that she had a place in technology. Now, how can this work at your company? Consider L, who spent the last month implementing your container strategy. She's sharp. She always is great at answering questions. And she's always willing to lend a hand to solve problems. Well, why not lend her privilege by sending her to that Docker conference that always begs you to speak? And you don't even do Docker. You can't even spell Docker. Why not let her go so that she can also see that she has a place in technology? The third type of privilege lending is expertise lending. And that's providing a voice to someone without privilege. People of color, we often feel that we don't have a voice in tech companies because we lack the racial privilege that a lot of tech leaders that we see on the cover of Fortune magazine and in the Wall Street Journal have. But I think that expertise lending can fix this. I was at South by Southwest uh, this past March, and our, our first lady was there. And she gave a great keynote, and she gave a great description of expertise lending. She said this. She said, if you've got a voice at the table, ask, is there diversity around the table? Are there voices and opinions that don't sound like yours? That is expertise lending. Looking out for those voices in your company, maybe in your GitHub repros, who you don't hear a lot from. How can you help those folks out? Well, let's consider M who is one of your best developers, and you know, she has always done good work. Doing code reviews with her is a joy because she's really good. Why not let her be a team lead for a project? By giving her the opportunity to lead, you can help her lend her voice to your company. So those are the three types of privileged lending, and it doesn't take much effort to do this. In fact, I hope that while I've been speaking, you've thought of other types of privilege that you can lend. But I want to caution you that lending privilege is not a silver bullet. It's not something you try once and it fails, and you're like, oh, well, I give it a try. It didn't work. It's a philosophy that you have to buy into. You have to believe in that bazaar that Eric Raymond described in his book and that there are benefits to having truly inclusive technology teams, whether that's on the development side or in QA or in DevOps or even in leadership, you have to believe that inclusion is worth the investment of your time. Now, I know that some of you are probably unconvinced. And you think that, well, diversity and inclusion, that's not something I should care about. You may think that these concepts have nothing to do with building software. But while I don't have any proof, I'm sure that when Leonard Nimoy went into the offices of that studio, that some of them thought, well, what does paying a black woman have to do with making a sci-fi TV show? And I think that if Leonard Nimoy was posed that question, he would respond that it has everything to do with making a sci-fi TV show. Because a man who played a character that truly symbolized the power of infinite diversity and infinite combinations had to believe that there is power in creating an environment where everyone is welcome to bring their ideas, their talents, their perspectives, and their passions to making art. 
So I hope that as you build the art of your operations and the art of your software, that if you want people of color, women, LGBT people to not only enter the technology sector, but stay and get promoted, if we want that boisterous bazaar where no bug is deep, then everyone has a role to play in lending your privilege. Thank you. Right, so the question is, if I am not a hiring manager, if I don't have a hiring function, what can I do to help make my company more diverse? Well, I think that there are a few things that you can do. One is by speaking up and then letting the person who does have that function know that you're interested in that, that you recognize that there are certain voices in this company that may not feel comfortable here and that you'd like to see that change. I think that there are other ways that you can also help. You can look at, well, what's our selection process, right? When I was in business school, I took a class on HR and selection is a really meaty topic and most companies do it badly. You can see in your company, well, how do we do that? You know, how do we look at resumes? Do we do blind resumes where we remove any identifying information and just look at skills? We can look at, well, how do we post jobs to our job boards? In fact, Google realized that when they were posting job boards or posting uh, to their page that listed their jobs, that if you put like dense text, that often female applicants would back away because they'll see all this text and they'll say, well, okay, I can't do that and I can't do that and I can kind of do that, but I'm not really all that great at it. But male applicants would see a list of requirements and like, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I kind of stick at that, but I think I, that I can do the job. Because that's how men are just built in the society. And they found that by having more bulleted lists um, and that are really stripped down, that, and by doing better descriptions, that they got better applicants from, they got a better pool of applicants who were women. So you can have a role to play by speaking up and by looking into your hiring processes and saying, well, how can we optimize this? You know, DevOps is all about optimizations, right? How can we optimize? So I think that that's one way. All right? Sure. Right. So if I understand your question, it's companies tend to hire people who are like them. And so how can we break that habit and really have more diverse companies? Is that? Right. So I think a lot of it is having conversations about this. And uh, if you're a leader in your company or if you know the, the founder or the CEO, having a, a conversation, say, hey, I think that we can enrich our culture by being more inclusive and here are my ideas. I think that you also have to go to where the diversity is. Uh, if you guys have off-sites or if you have team building exercises, why not do it in a different part of town uh, where people who aren't like you live and do it at a community center or some area because a, a, a lot of the reasons why we struggle with being inclusive is that it's human nature to fear what's not like you. Uh, you know, when we were all cavemen, uh, what works is safe, right? Okay, I'm not dead yet, so what I've been doing must be okay because I'm still alive. And it takes a lot of work, it takes our higher brain functions to realize that there may be problems with continuing to do what we've been doing, continuing to hire the people who we hire, continuing the culture that we have, and you have to make effort to do that. And a lot of that is just being exposed. And I think that you'll find that if you, as you expose your company to people who are different, to different voices, then that unfamiliar, that feeling uh, this is unfamiliar and I'm, and I'm uncomfortable will eventually go down. This is not a binary solution, right? It's, it's analog, it's very organic. It doesn't happen overnight, but you have to start. Absolutely. And, I, and so, so the comment, and I take your point very well, that yeah, actually understand the spaces that you work in and how by giving space to people who don't occupy those spaces, that can be a, a big deal, right? Uh, maybe some of you who are speakers and you've been invited, say, hey, I know a great speaker, let me give you her, her number. Uh, I've, I've done that. I've, I'm very much, if you talk with me one-on-one -on -one and I'll be around, and if you're, if you're someone who I don't typically see on stage at, pla at places like this, I'm going to probably talk to you about speaking at conferences. I'm going to understand what you do, I'm going to figure out what your passion is, and I'm going to say, you know what, I think there's a great proposal that you can submit to South by Southwest, or to another DevOps days, or to a uh, GitHub conference. Uh, you can get your voice out there, and so uh, I'm very passionate about getting people uh, into those spaces. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you, everybody. Uh, follow, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you.